And this means I am the, the fifth person from the last in the lab. The, this, it was a really great moment in, to be in Gobin's lab. And it was also really great experience to learn from Tan. So it was really good experience for me. And this is last. This is the in collaboration with LED Marine Biology Convergence Technology Research Center, and Junchal did most of the work in, for this experiment. Thank you. Thank you, Young. There's a question over there. Hello. Uh, how uh, did you plan that experiment that, you know, uh, radiating the fishes with different uh, wavelength will actually result into increasing their mobility? Like, what is happening at, at the level of the fish? I mean, why their mobility is increasing? I mean, how you got the idea of designing that experiment? So, idea to examine the effect of different wavelengths yeah, so, on fishes. I mean, what is happening with the fishes that they are like, you know, just, you know, randomizing uh, with some so speed? So, the, the, the difference we checked in this system was we checked the, we calculate, measured the speed of fish moving in the dark and then upon light activation. So, if there is no effect, so then speed should be the same. But if there is an effect on inducing the photo response, then there must be change in the speed of fish. Or you saw the, the, the kind of spectrum in, in the video file. So the, another way we can calculate the movement of fish is that we can calculate the, the frequency of fish appear in that section. Okay. So that's the way you can check. All right. So it, was, it is more about the visibility oh. you, you are saying? Or the so in, in one of the applications for fishing lamp is rather than just incorporating the blue light LED, which shows the deepest penetration, it may be better to include, to, to induce more efficient movement. It may be better to include the LED of wavelength, which is consistent to the absorption maximum of the photoreceptor. That is more effective in inducing the response. All right, thank you. I think we have to move on. Thank um, you. Thank you. So we'll continue the session on uh, GPCRs. We'll continue the session with Dr. Prashen Shelikani. Um, he had a PhD of the University of Manitoba, which is in Canada, and then associated with Gobin's lab from 2003 till 2007. And then he moved back to Manitoba and rose through the ranks of the professorship and is now a full professor at that university. And so Prashen will um, discuss taste receptors, uh, in particular bitter receptors uh, for us today. So Prashen, please. Thanks, Nico. And uh, thanks to Tom and Rajender for uh, organizing a wonderful symposium. Definitely, yeah, this is one of those, uh, yeah, keeps on going, eh? That's nice. So, as you can see, I'm in the Department of Oral Biology. I think most of you don't know what oral biology means, right? So I'll be, as I go through the lecture, I'll be talking about uh, taste receptors, which makes more sense to be in oral biology, right? Okay, so before I move on with the science, actual science, this is something we do other than science, used to do other than science in Gobin's lab, eh? and Tom was the skipper. And uh, so we went, uh, well, this has nothing to do with Jong's thing, eh? well, it's more of a coincidence, <laughs> the deep sea fishing. So, so deep sea fishing means, yeah, we used to go 30 or 40 kilometers, I think, each day, so the day starts at five in the morning, and uh, half a day or full day, full day. <laughs> so, so we went for three years, at least uh, when I was there, three years, and uh, the irony is I never caught a fish. Eh? 
So when I used to come back, my wife used to say, okay, where is the fish, eh? She was a little bit, <laughs> first tell it was okay, after that it's like if you're not showing the fish, eh? Like it's, uh, anyway, so that was like one of those, uh, it's very, very uh, interesting. And then uh, uh, this, uh, these are pictures from uh, uh, Gobind and Tom's lab from uh, 2004. So you can see uh, uh, the Whitehead Institute in the background, Tom and Gobin. Here they are sort of <laughs> towards the end, eh? <laughs> so they are sort of flanking the group, eh? And then, yeah, uh, you have Phil, a uh, lot of people there, Judy, Parvati, and yeah, you can see me at the back, and Jay, yeah, Phil, yeah, a lot of people, and uh, you can see Gobin in action, sort of moving around, very active. And that's our building, eh? Uh, the biology building in the back, that's where the lab used to be. And uh, 2006, fast forward, uh, yeah, this was, uh, I think, the last uh, Christmas dinner we had as a lab. So that was Gobin, that's uh, Julia, Gobin's daughter, Mike, Judy, and uh, Parvati, she's no, she was a postdoc along with me. So we were two postdocs uh, towards the end. And uh, so she's now a lawyer, right? Eh? So she felt law is better than science, yeah, so that's good. So that was our, uh, these are some of the memories yeah, uh, from uh, the four years, close to four years I had with uh, Gobin's, uh, with Gobin. Yeah, he is more than a person for me, so. Moving on uh, to what I did after that, 2007 is when I started my research. So the first couple of years, I had to figure out what to do. And one of the things is the acting dean at that time, when I was recruited, he said, okay, you're working on GPCRs. How does that relate to dentistry? So I had to look for something that is orally relevant. And that's when I figured out taste receptors. So it's more by chance that I happened to actually work on taste receptors. And these are GPCRs, right? So right now in my lab, I have a couple of uh, different uh, areas like we have basic and clinical uh, studies looking at structure function and physiological role of these uh, beta taste receptors. And then we also have applied industrial uh, collaborations, grants, and startup companies that are involved in taste blockers, elucidating new blockers, and also development of uh, GPCR uh, autoimmune diagnostics using uh, GPCR anti autoantibodies eh, that are present. So these, this is uh, in uh, collaboration with a company from New York. Moving on to the basic uh, science, like that's what I'm going to uh, mention today. Human taste perceptions. These are all considered as taste perceptions, right? But unfortunately, hot is not an actual basic taste. Hot means we are sensing pain, nociception, right? Same thing with uh, cool, menthol. It's not considered as a basic taste. So people always get confused between hot, uh, cool, spicy. Spicy is not an actual taste. It's a combination of tastes. Right? So what are the basic taste sensations? There are five of them so far. Things might uh, add on down the road. Of these five taste sensations, umami, sweet, and bitter, these are the ones that are sensed by G-protein coupled receptors, or GPCRs, right? And of these three, umami and sweet are sensed by three receptors, depending on how the receptors combine. So you, have, you look at the green one here, that is common for both umami and sweet. That is known as the T1R3. And then you have the T1R1 that is specific for umami. So this thing, when it combines with uh, the green, the T1R3, it gives you the umami sensation. The same thing with sweet, right? And when you come to bitter, so these two belong to class C GPCRs. GPCRs, the, it's a big family. And these two belong to the class C, the metabotrophic receptors. Whereas bitter receptors, there are 25 in humans. And uh, right now, they are classified as uh, class T. That's a recent classification. No basis for that. So they're sort of an orphan. They float around the GPCR family, but there are 25 of these. So these receptors constitute the third largest among the GPCR family, if we can actually uh, look at it in a different perspective from the chemosensory angle. And coming to the other uh, salt, uh, taste sensations, the salt and sour, these are sensed by channels. So my topic is on bitter receptors. As I said, there are 25 receptors in humans, eh? and these things are not just present in the oral cavity. They're present throughout the system, right? And uh, we don't know what they're doing in different part, parts of the body, right? 
And one of the uh, things we are focusing right now is a cystic fibrosis. And I will be looking, uh, like we are pursuing uh, certain angles in that which I'm going to talk in the next few minutes. So cystic fibrosis, what is that? It's a genetic disease and autosomal recessive mutation. CFTR, so here you're looking at a uh, healthy chloral transport. It's a transport a mutation, the CFTR, which is a transport uh, channel. Uh, so uh, things normally uh, go okay in the healthy state, in the disease state. You don't have efficient chloride transport because of that. Sodium gets transported in, but uh, chloride is not pumped out. Of that, because of that, you get a thicky mucus. And uh, that mucus acts as sort of the nutrients for bacteria to grow on. That's how bacterial infection starts. Right? And that's the leading cause of death. So bacterial infection uh, leads to chronic uh, inflammation and that leads to failure of the lung. That's the uh, sort of uh, the pathway that occurs. Right? And uh, according to Cystic Fibrosis Canada, CF Canada, uh, the median age of survival in Canada is around 48 years. The disease is not curable. It's not just confined to North America or Europe. This is also present in China, India, but it's not detected. That's one of the uh, things that uh, is coming up now. And whether it causes the same phenotype, that we don't know yet. The cost per patient is around uh, 300 to 400,000 in Canada because we have a, a global uh, health uh, supported system. The government supports uh, the health care. So the costs are pretty high. And these are totally covered by the government. So it is uh, an expense to treat this particular thing. So as I said, CF is uh, predominantly a bacterial uh, infection. Bacterial infection is the one that causes, to, causes uh, inflammation eh? and then lung failure. So how do these bacteria talk to each other? Most of us know, quorum sensing, right? Depending on which molecules are synthesized. So each bacteria have their own sort of uh, uh, molecules that they synthesize. For example, here we're looking at uh, HSL, homoserolactones, and uh, those, and uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, that's the main culprit here in CF. That's the one that causes uh, infections in CF. Eh? There are a lot of other bacteria too, gram negative and so on. But uh, So these are some of the QSMs we are looking at. And also the antibiotics that are used in CF treatment. Levofloxacin, tobramycin, azithromycin. The reason why I'm mentioning uh, these three, we'll be uh, looking at these in the next few slides. Eh? This uh, uh, received approval from Health Canada in 2016. That's last December. So it's now uh, publicly available in Canada, not in the US. It's available in Europe and uh, Canada. Uh, so again, uh, we'll be looking close into these uh, three antibiotics. So coming to uh, the relationship between T2Rs and uh, quorum sensing. The first study that showed was published in 2010, where they suggested that uh, quorum sensing molecules, AHLs, along with T2R agonists can cause, can activate uh, the airway cells through T2Rs. So that's one of, that was one of the first studies that showed, uh, after that there were uh, many studies in JCA and uh, many other journals, uh, including uh, chronic rhinositis, that's a condition, uh, uh, so in, inflammation of the sinus, eh? uh, where things bacteria play a major role. So T2Rs are uh, known to be involved in uh, interacting with QSMs, but what's not known is how does it play in a CF condition? Right? And also what's not known is uh, how do these molecules taste? Getting a, a human taste panel to taste these molecules is tough. Getting ethics approval will be beyond the, yeah, it's, right? So to go around that, we use something known as an E-tongue, an electronic tongue. That's what you're looking at here. It's like a pH meter, right? It has all the sensors. And those are the sensors that dip into these uh, things, unknown solutions. It gives a readout. The only issue here is uh, it's $200,000, eh? pretty expensive, right? And uh, so what does it do? You can take, uh, so here looking at a, a table that uh, it generates, like uh, uh, the first uh, few compounds are bitter compounds, caffeine, quinine, dextromethorphan, that's a cough suppressant, right? And these are the concentrations that, uh, that are used in these uh, carousels, in these uh, vials, eh? This These bitterness scores are from an actual taste panel. So for caffeine and quinine, it's easier to get an uh, approval, ethics approval eh, for a taste panel. So those uh, can be done. So those are the actual results from a taste panel, whereas these are the predicted scores from the E-tongue. So all this column represents the score from the E-tongue. Eh? 
So if you look at these, uh, it's pretty much close, sort of uh, agrees with that. So dextromethorphan, that's not known. So uh, that's what it says. So the higher the score, the more better it is, right? So these ones, the ones you're looking towards then, these are the quorum sensing molecules. So we use them as a load because in CF, it's not just one quorum sensing molecule. It's a combination of them that causes the infection, right? So the CF, in CF, the load is high. Right, so uh, we did the load means we are combining a couple of these molecules together and then looking at it, right? And if you look at these numbers, look at these uh, low numbers, 0.25 millimolar, and you're looking at 12 plus. It's more than what quinine or caffeine tastes like. So the taste of these, the bitterness of these according to the E-tongue, these are very, very bitter, right? So now the actual thing is, okay, the E-tongue is saying something. Does it actually translate into a response, a physiological response. So that's what we, we, we are trying. trying. So this is the hypothesis. Like these are the pathways that the uh, T2Rs act through. We know bacteria act through the LPS and TLRs. That's already a well-established pathway. But what's not known is whether these things act through T2Rs causing inflammation in the CF airway. So what we did is we used encounter analysis sequencing. So we sequence a lot of uh, tissues, not only from patients. These are uh, CFI uh, is a cystic fibrosis established cell line, immortalized. NULI is an airway cell line, uh, immortalized. And in addition, in addition to these, we also looked at breast cancer cells, uh, MBE-231, MDA, MCF-10A, and a lot of things. But what we found is the expression pattern is similar. These 25 receptors, respect of which cell line you're looking at, the way they are uh, coming uh, up is similar. Eh? And again, it shows like here, unfortunately, that's one of the disadvantages with encounter. If the sequence homology is very high, more than 90%, it's very tough to design probes that can detect those uh, uh, between uh, the different genes. Eh? So we did uh, validate uh, some of these with the flow cytometry. Uh, uh, getting antibodies is also tough for these, but uh, for the ones we had, we looked at those and uh, uh, it is. Uh, so as I said, uh, there is a specific pattern of expression with 14 and 20, the one that, that are highlighted in blue, showing the highest irrespective of which tissue we're looking at. So both in CUFI and the uh, CF and the normal, it's the same. Eh? That means there's no differential expression based on the disease state. So we also looked at donors, CF. So this is before and after lung transplant. Bronchoscope is from a CF patient. Eh? Uh, we had up to five donors, so uh, depending on the heterozygosity of those uh, people. So, and again, just to uh, take a message from this slide is uh, no significant difference in T2R expression between CF and non CF cells. Not only us, there is another group in Europe that showed that they looked at 200 patients. They didn't see any difference in uh, CF expression, uh, T2R expression between CF and non CF. So we moved on uh, trying to look at, okay, what are the quorum sensing molecules that might be actually causing this increase, right? So we're trying to actually look at the signaling pathway, the complete pathway, right from the receptor all the level to uh, what causes the calcium increase or decrease, right? And as I said, we are using a load to mimic uh, the physiological, uh, physiological effects in a biofilm, like a cocktail of uh, things we are using. We use different inhibitors, right? And uh, also, on a parallel setting, we looked at heterologous systems. So we have stable cell lines that express these receptors at high levels. And uh, using those, uh, we did the same thing, trying to see whether we, what we saw with the uh, primary cells from the donors uh, actually applies to uh, these uh, stable cells. And then we wanted to figure out which uh, quorum sensing molecule is actually involved. So we looked at C4, C8, C12. C12 is one of the most common ones. So we looked at those with respect to each of the T2Rs in stable cells. Eh? And what we found is C12 activates uh, three of the four we tested. Eh? And uh, some of them, they don't, like T2R1 didn't get activated. Uh, so uh, there is some uh, diversity here, but the trend uh, uh, looks similar. Eh? So we are also looking at the physiological effects, which I'm not going to go into. What happens, uh, how, do, how do they cause inflammation? And uh, those responses, those are the ones we are looking at in that. But what's more interesting is the antibiotics. And here, 
what we already know is that, okay, these things kill, right? And uh, what's not known is, what is the effect of these antibiotics on these? Because remember, these are mostly bitter tasting drugs. Right? And as I said, uh, uh, levofloxacin uh, was released in Canada in 2016. It's uh, the first uh, fluoroquinolone antibiotic to receive uh, marketing authorization. Eh? So around the same time, that's last December, we got uh, an inquiry from this company. They posed these three questions to us. Eh? So the f first thing is inhalation of an antibiotic with a very bitter taste, such as levofloxacin. Could it have any additional effects? Additional means non-antibiotic effects, right? So they wanted to know what else it's doing other than killing bacteria, right? And also they are looking at, is there any possibility to de define the difference between the effect of T2Rs between different uh, inhaled uh, antibiotics? So it's not just levofloxacin, they are also interested in other things. Anyway, we didn't get funding from them. Uh, things change fast, eh, with pharmaceutical companies. This particular division uh, from Horizon Pharma, uh, the CF division was sold to Chelsea, Europe, and those guys just uh, fired all the CF people there. Right? So it went pretty fast. But anyway, so we, uh, the things that they posed were very interesting. So we started pursuing the first two. The third one is more of a physiological uh, impact there. So the first is to define whether these uh, antibiotics activate T2Rs. If so, how many? And what is the specificity? Eh? So again, we use the same thing, eh? E-tongue, right? So we looked at these, and these are the scores. So some of them are very bitter, like azithromycin, looking at a score of 15. Eh? Whereas the levofloxacin, uh, it's around four. Levofloxacin, tobromycin, those are the two commonly used uh, CF antibiotics, antibiotics and CF treatment. Eh? Those. Are. And what's interesting is the ones that are highlighted, the uh, one in red, eh? levofloxacin and quinine, they share the same quinoline ring, quinoline ring. So, uh, it, so we wanted to test out, okay, this one is highly bitter, even at 0.3 millimolar, whereas this is, even if you take one millimolar, it's not showing that, eh? So uh, does it correlate to the number of receptors it is activating, bitter receptors, or is there something else at play, right? At the same time, we're looking at uh, between the different antibiotics, like is, does the functional group play a role, eh? So to do this, as I said, we took a structure function approach. So before that, we did analysis in stable cell lines, expressing these receptors. So we looked at four receptors initially, four, 14, and 14 and or 20. Uh, these are the three receptors that are expressed at high levels. If you remember my encounter sequencing result, these irrespective of which tissue, 4, 14, and 20 are always at high levels. Eh? So we included those three. And also we included uh, T2R1. Eh? T2R1 is at the lower level. It's not expressed highly in tissues. Eh? And what we found is uh, levofloxacin, it does have, uh, uh, it, it is activating multiple T2Rs eh? compared to azithromycin, which is uh, having high noise for some of these eh? T2Rs. T2R1 did not respond to all the three antibiotics tested. That means there's a lot of variation, specificity. Eh? So next we wanted to figure out where they are binding. That, uh, the other experiment the, uh, on stable cell lines, it can be just uh, uh, error prone too, right? So we wanted to test it out, do a docking. So that's what we did here, a more, uh, pharmacological characterization. Eh? And uh, so these are the secondary structures uh, of the T2R. So we're looking at four, 14. We also did on 20, I'm not showing that here. So the ones uh, that are highlighted in uh, red are the amino acids that we targeted for mutations. So there are close to 20 amino acids in each receptor, uh, 20 mutations, sorry, in each receptor that we uh, generated. Eh? And then we looked at how they bind to levo and tobra. As I said, azithro doesn't bind properly. It binds to only one receptor, so we kept it uh, aside. We looked at these two. Is there any specificity or difference between them? Eh? And side directed metagenesis was used. And uh, so these are docking results, like so uh, the ones that are, uh, so the, uh, these ones you're looking at, you can, this is the ECL2 loop. This was what uh, Sadhu was uh, about to give a lecture on, eh? That's his uh, thing. And even in angiotensin, irrespective of which GPC you're looking at, ECL2 plays a key role. As you can see here, a lot of messages from that are involved in binding. Even though beta receptors don't belong to class A GPCRs, they still have the same uh, features, structural features, eh? So ECL2 plays a key role 
and mostly it's like a superficial binding. They're not binding deep. And that's what we are looking at here too. It's like uh, on the periphery. It's, the ECL2 is acting as a lid over these rather than actually binding deep, the molecules binding deep. Eh? So uh, the orientation of the quinoline structure is sort of dictating how these things are, uh, the difference between quinine and uh, levofloxacin. And also, uh, quinine is making multiple contacts with ECL2. So uh, that might sort of explain. Quinine is known to activate eight beta receptors, eight of the 25, whereas uh, levofloxacin, so far we found it activates three of the four we tested. Eh? So uh, this, there are structural variations there. Uh, which can be explained. And then uh, we also looked at uh, 14, that's the other one. Uh, Flophenomic acid, that's it's sort of a cognate uh, ligand. I couldn't say, it's, well, I can't say it's a cognate because it's a synthetic one, eh? but that's the one, uh, that's an agonist, just like quinine for T2R4. Flophenomic acid uh, activates, uh, T2, is known to activate 14. Eh? So uh, the same thing with uh, diphenhydramine, that's also known uh, to activate uh, T2R14. Tobramycin levo, the same two things we tested. Again, it's a mutational study. Take home message again is yes, ECL2 plays a critical role. There are few residues. The moment you take them out, the receptor doesn't bind, right? Rather, irrespective of which uh, ligand you're looking at. Right? So that's, again, not known in the field. This is something new in the test field. So uh, this is where we are at like uh, I'm not going into the physiological role. We're still looking at what happens in an actual CF patient with these. Eh? So coming to the conclusions, first one is no significant difference in expression between T2Rs, eh? in T2Rs between CF and non-CF uh, uh, cells. Uh, and these uh, uh, quorum sensing molecules along with the bitter uh, tasting antibiotics can activate T2Rs. But the way they're doing uh, is different. The mechanisms might be different. So the first question, uh, to answer the, one of the first questions uh, from these guys, uh, uh, yes, uh, they do have uh, predominant roles. Antibiotics can uh, have non-antibiotic roles, depending on uh, the tissue uh, they're acting on. Eh? And then uh, uh, we are also looking at, as I said, the third uh, angle is uh, the physiological uh, effect of these, the QSMs in uh, CF. That's something we are looking at the inflammatory cascade. Our hypothesis, they are anti-inflammatory. Uh, and we have data that shows IL-10 and sort of other cytokines are elevated in, uh, upon activation by these QSMs. Eh? And also, not only in CF, we also have it in the oral cavity. Strep mutants secretes uh, CSPs, competence stimulating peptides. And we have data that shows that those things also activate uh, T2Rs in the oral cavity, causing anti-inflammatory effects. So the mechanisms seem to be similar. So if you have activation of these bitter receptors in different tissues, they cause uh, protective uh, responses. That's uh, sort of a preliminary summary from our studies. So we'd like to acknowledge uh, people in the lab. And Dr. Renesha Singh, she was a research associate. She is a research associate for the past eight years in my lab, and then a PhD student and a BSc dent student, DMD. So one of the good things working in a clinical faculty is uh, you get a lot of uh, DMD and MD uh, students working uh, in the lab. Eh? So he's a DMD uh, student, and uh, Firoz is again a PhD candidate. And so we have a microbiology expert, uh, which whom we collaborate with in the lab in the department, Kangmin Duan. John Hundron, he runs the CF uh, lung transplant facility in McGill. So he supplies us with uh, all the tissues we need, along with uh, Bob, uh, who is a research associate in John's lab. And the funding is from NSERC and CF Canada. They are the ones that are supporting our project on quorum sensing molecules and uh, their role in CF, eh? Children's Hospital Foundation, too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Prashant. Thanks. Maybe we have time for a question or two, I guess. Yeah. I really wish to know that uh, you use model of T2R4 and T2R14. Is our molecular models yes, yes. predicted models? Yes, predicted and, and validated. No, no, that, that's fine. How you predicted this model? I'm very much concerned about using a predicted model and then doing docking. Yeah. I, I'm really very, very concerned, and you are showing interactions at those means what was how you really build, predict so, the model? Prediction, the that's all. So validation and prediction, so we do mutational studies. No, 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 how you predicted the model? 
Oh, oh, these are iTaser. So we have iTaser. Yeah. Uh, so what sure. was the template they took? Uh, so iTaser takes multiple templates. I, I know. What what yeah. was your scores? Q scores. What was your Q score? So I'm we okay. To know. Uh, we have eight publications on that. 